Your analysis of Occupy as being kind of a kind of a think tank is is, is a good one because mm -hmm. I've referred to it and others have as well as sort of a people's think tank mm -hmm. that you know most people don't have the ability to just show up at a think tank yeah. you know they're in big office parks you have to have a PhD to get a job there yeah. it's inaccessible for the average person mm -hmm. but Occupy you could during the time of the Zuccotti Park encampment you could just show up mm -hmm. and even now you can go to the website nycga.net mm -hmm. and find meetings and things happening and you don't need an invitation for mm -hmm. most of them I mean some of them I'm sure you need to be on a list but generally speaking mm -hmm. you, you, just, just show up. you just show up and introduce yourself and, or not you know just show up and you're there and you can and it's easy to participate and it's just regular people talking about ideas about where we think you know where where we would like to see society going and I hesitate I, I hesitated there when I said we think because yeah. there's such diversity of opinion mm -hmm. there really is no we think it's mm -hmm. you come in with your opinion I come in with my opinion we find we have some common ground we find some things we disagree on a lot of people have tried to classify Occupy as being one set of ideas or or you know one shared values I would say the shared values might be that things are kind of screwed up mm -hmm. and we want to talk about solutions but there's no you'll find everybody from from uh, from socialists to anarchists to art capitalists mm -hmm. who have a reformist perspective there's a, a, a working group that uh, is geared toward reforming the banking system mm -hmm. well none of the people in that working group would consider themselves I'm guessing socialists or anarchists or anything like that most of them are people who work work or have worked in the finance industry and want to and want to reform that mm -hmm. but then there are other people who want to re remake the world as an anarcho syndicalist collective mm -hmm. you have all and there's every stripe in between mm -hmm. uh, and I saw kind of the the Zuccotti Park encampment uh, many have described it as an example of prefigurative politics mm -hmm envisioning the world as, as they'd like it to be mm -hmm. uh, and demonstrating that but it's also a relational art installation mm -hmm. uh, in that you know people see it. a protest march to me is relational art mm -hmm. uh, people see it it's happening but you can also join the march people in the march talk to people in, as the spectators and you talk back and forth because these aren't pre-printed factory signs from some consultant they're just hand-drawn signs on cardboard anybody can go up to a, a pile of trash grab a piece of cardboard and a, and a marker mm -hmm. make a sign and join the march and mm -hmm. you're a part of Occupy Wall Street there's no membership card mm -hmm. and I think that's what's different about it mm -hmm. than the typical labor movement of today it's a, it's somewhat exclusionary you have to know someone to get in the union or get a particular job to be in the union mm -hmm. this is more like the origins of that movement in the 30s mm -hmm. you know where people just kind of form these groups oh, sorry that's right my yes. people just kind of join these uh, form these groups and just went mm -hmm. you know um, so I think that's what's kind of neat about it and what none of us in our generation have really seen before. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to ask about, you mentioned also that uh, Occupy Wall Street brings together really huge variety of, of different people, different groups and so on. Um, how do you see all those, because the idea how future could be or what would be alternative to existing system, every group sees it really differently. You're right, people are coming from very different perspectives. You have people who have families and union jobs and kind of a stable life and do things one way. You have other people who are, you know, 19 year olds who really think that and, and who really believe that they're going to completely reshape the world, that they're going to somehow unwind the whole system that's already there, build something new, and that somehow it will work completely better than everything that's been tried. 
as you can probably deduce, I think that that's a little bit, my view is that that's a little naive, but you know what, we need the dreamers. You know, they should not listen to people like me. <laughs> I'm glad they're there. Mm -hmm. I may roll my eyes, but I would never discourage them from thinking big thoughts mm -hmm. because they see the world from a fresh perspective mm -hmm. that someone who's been knocked around a little isn't going to see. Mm -hmm. And even if even if nine out of ten of the ideas they come up with won't have been tried before and won't work for whatever reason, mm -hmm. that tenth idea is a gem. Mm -hmm. So I think it's really important that everybody have these different perspectives and the disagreements and the hashing it out mm -hmm. and the learning about each other's point of view mm -hmm. is the process. And I think it's more about the process than the result. Because mm -hmm. what to me may be, and look, we're going to see the word occupy and the meme occupy, I think for many, many years. Mm -hmm. But it may not be Occupy Wall Street as mm -hmm. it was in Zuccotti Park and as it exists now. Because people move on. They get the core group, they get jobs, they go to college or, or return to college, or they get married, or, you know, all kinds of things happen. But we'll see this meme continue. But I think more importantly, what's in place is a communications and technological and mm -hmm. interactive infrastructure mm -hmm. on the left. Mm -hmm. In America, the left was really missing in action. There really was no left. Mm -hmm. There were moderates and conservatives mm -hmm. because the Democratic Party, in order to get any kind of power, mm -hmm. had moved to the center. And then the right had, had moved things right of center. Mm -hmm. So there really was no left to speak of. There were some, there were leftists, but yeah. no organized left. Mm -hmm. And to me, what Occupy has done is given an umbrella for the under which the left can organize. Mm -hmm. All these groups that were doing things already, various advocacy groups, various labor unions, um, artists and writers who are not a part of any group but certainly have leftist ideas and, and communicate them. Mm -hmm. Now there's a framework mm -hmm. in which people can operate. People mm -hmm. have met. There are websites and social networks and, and, and Twitter feeds and, and events. Everything from street marches and rallies where you can go and be in a, and, and express your views in a public way mm -hmm. to meetings in church basements that are a, a safer space mm -hmm. where you can talk with like-minded folks or not even like-minded folks people who are interested in the same problems mm -hmm. and may have different ideas about solutions mm -hmm. but how did you got involved with the Occupy and have you been involved before certain grassroots activism approach to well, life? I've been, I've been involved in my union at work for many years. Mm -hmm. um, that's always been important to me, but that's really, that's it's related certainly, but it's different because it's an established union that's been around. I work for a big company. So it's a different sort of thing than what Occupy is, but clearly related. Um, I, I'll tell you, it's funny, is a lot of people have pointed out that, that the Zuccotti Park encampment started out because Adbusters Magazine had it published an op-ed piece. I used to read Adbusters Magazine many, many years ago after reading um, a book by its founder, uh, Kali Lawson, called Culture Jam. And so I read it, but then I stopped reading it because um, although I agreed with you know 90% of their criticisms of, of, of corporate world and big business and culture today, I, there were some, uh, and not to get off the track, there were some issues that I disagreed with them on. And so I said, eh, I don't have to read Adbusters anymore. Mm -hmm. But then, and the funny thing is, if I had continued that subscription, or you know, I actually don't think I ever subscribed. But if I continued buying it every week, and and continued, um, you know, or every every how often it came out, if I continued reading it regularly, uh, I probably would have been aware of, of of this call before anybody showed up at Zuccotti Park. Mm -hmm. So I've shared these ideas and this point of view for a long time, but because I stopped reading it, I didn't know that there was going to be an Occupy Wall Street until it showed up there. Mm -hmm. And until I saw it, I think I first saw it on the Colbert Report. Mm -hmm. I didn't even see it on the news or anything. I think I saw it on Stephen Colbert. I'd heard, I'd heard, oh yeah, there's this protest downtown. 
But it's New York. There are lots of protests around downtown. Yeah. You know, and I didn't realize, you know, that this is special until I saw it on on Stephen Colbert, and I, who I coincidentally grew up in my neighborhood in Charleston, South Carolina, of all places. But I saw it and. Um, and I went, wow, this is different. I have to get down there. And so I wasn't there on day one, but I was there with the first, within the first week. Mm -hmm. I was there like maybe day four or day five. How, did, then, you, how did you recognize that it's different? I had never seen... The idea of an encampment was not something I'd seen before in America. Okay. Um, I mean... Historically, they have had, certainly there have been, there was Hooverville, and there have been protest encampments in America in history, <laughs> but I'd never seen it in my life. <laughs> Not something I'd seen in my lifetime. And I said, wow, this is neat, and I, and I knew what the issues were, you know, because uh, I could see the signs and the pictures. Like, these are the issues that I've been interested in for years. Mm -hmm. I have to get down there. And I went down there and saw it, and I was like, it's like they made this for me. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. these are the issues I care about. You know, these are these are my people. Mm -hmm. I have to spend as much. And I never, I did not live in the encampment. Uh, I certainly spent a lot of time there, but I didn't roll out a sleeping bag yeah. at any point in, in Zuccotti Park. You didn't quit your job, also. No, didn't yeah. quit my job. Didn't roll out a sleeping bag in Zuccotti Park. Now, since they've done some other public sleeping protests at the stock exchange and things like that. Mm -hmm. I have done that. Mm -hmm. So I have camped with Occupy Wall Street in that mm -hmm. regard and traveled to Chicago with a group mm -hmm. from Occupy Wall Street uh, and that sort of thing. Uh, but was not a Zuccotti Park camper, mm -hmm. but was a regular presence there from the first week. Mm -hmm. you know. But I wanted to ask also about the origins of the movement or how it was designed because I think what is most fascinating is it's um, how it's like how it really tries to not to define what are the concrete needs and this I think goes against the kind of primal urge that you have when you are thinking critically of existing society that you are against something but then as a next step comes that let's do this let's make a revolution or something like that but this is like uh, the slogans it's been really emphasized that it doesn't have any concrete demands it doesn't have any concrete like program manifesto that you can get categorized this movement easily thanks to right. that um, but uh, how did it happen like was it at Buster Kalle Lassen design that the main slogan we are the 99% and this all is 99 1% and this you know this life they made experiment the, ad busters, the, the piece in Adbusters made the call for people to descend on Wall Street mm -hmm. and, uh, and and have this protest but that was kind of where Adbusters that was kind of the extent of what they did mm -hmm. as I understand it there was a group the New York City General Assembly which was kind of an ad hoc group that came together uh, and kind of answered that call and they sort of put together everything mm -hmm. um, a person to talk to to get plugged in who, who could tell you about that would be a guy named Justin Wiedes, W-E-D-E-S. Um, again, there's no real... I mention that name just because I know he was in that group from mm -hmm. its from its beginnings. There's no, you're right, there's no real leader per se, and there are no demands per se. Mm -hmm. um, although everybody, I think, kind of knows what we're concerned about. Money, you know, people want to get the money out of politics. People want, uh, are concerned about, about corporations having uh, too much power over people's everyday lives. Mm -hmm. But as far as specific demands, well, once you make specific demands, then people on the other side can, can smear, you know, can, can rebut that. And once you have a leader, people can say, well, you know, this person was a member of this organization or, you know, likes peanut butter sandwiches or, you know, whatever <laughs> argument they can come up with yeah. to try to debase that person. Mm -hmm. Whereas if it's more open source, it's more like, hey, we know what the problems are. Even the Republicans, many of them, agree on what the problems are. A lot of them do not. You know, they may play lip service to it, but they don't really agree. But there are certainly some people who are on the other side of the fence, so to speak, mm -hmm. you know, who agree that these that these problems, it's just we have different ideas about solutions. Mm -hmm. 
And so I think it's more, I think, to me, I think the purpose of Occupy is to shift the political economy to the left mm -hmm. and to give people a forum for discussing ideas. Mm -hmm. Actual concrete solutions, well, that can come, in my view, from the institutions that are already in place. You know, Occupy shouldn't be writing legislation. Mm -hmm. We have legislators. Mm -hmm. What we need is to decouple that legislative body from the money delete mm -hmm. in society so that the laws that that legislative body has aren't written by lobbyists for big businesses, mm -hmm. aren't written by uh, the wealthy donors yeah. to members of Congress. They're written for the benefit of everyone mm -hmm. and in service of the whole country. Mm -hmm. And so I think Occupy is perfect. Like to me, Occupy, when, when the President of the United States was using Occupy Wall Street-esque language in mm -hmm. the State of the Union, mm -hmm. I saw that as, ah, that's what Occupy Wall Street did. We didn't um, write a piece of legislation or, or make a specific change, but what we did was give the President of the United States the intellectual space to stake out a, a, a more leftist position mm -hmm. than he would have been able to in the climate that existed on September 16th mm -hmm. as opposed to September 17th. Yeah. the demographics of the of the movement because it's uh, because it's how it's built or how it's functioning it's really based on discussion and negotiation and physically spending time together and getting to know each other and so on so it all takes a lot of time it consumes up a lot of time and time is obviously the biggest luxury so how this uh, movement struggles with the issue that who, who participates are uh, young, well-educated, uh, middle class or at least surviving well so they could actually afford to participate in this extremely time-consuming experiment of creating a new society. Yes. How do you struggle with that? That is a big issue. Um, there are people of all different income levels in Occupy, and there are people of all different ethnicities, and um, every sexual orientation and gender that, that one can imagine. There is that diversity. But you're, you are correct in that it tends to skew, it tends to skew toward um, privilege, Maybe not necessarily coming from a lot of money, mm -hmm. but some sort of privilege. Meaning, privilege can be, I'm really rich and don't have to work. But privilege can also be, I'm 19 and can sleep on my parents' couch and mm -hmm. I'm covered by their health insurance. Mm -hmm. So if I work a part-time job for some spending money, mm -hmm. I'm able to spend the bulk of my time doing this. Yep. That is a form of privilege. Um, I think there's a constant struggle with patriarchy uh, within the movement. Um, I, there are certainly lots of strong, uh, lots of strong women in the movement, but I think we need to hear their voices more. Uh, you know, not not that they're not expressing themselves, but I think that we as men need to hear their voices more. We need to we need to be more open to hearing. Fortunately, I think that's getting better. But that's been a problem in social movements for many, many years, yeah. uh, and, and, and continues. Mm -hmm. um, that, and that a lot of times, movements like this tend to be organized by alpha male types, yeah. and who aren't always open to, they want to hear from other alpha male types. Mm -hmm. And that's precisely who we need to not be <laughs> listening to as much, because that's who's running the organizations that are the problem to yeah. begin with. We need to hear from people who feel who feel marginalized by those organizations, mm -hmm. um, and so that's a constant struggle. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think another uh, more to your point is the question of privilege. Mm -hmm. That the people who are the most like I would have absolutely been much more involved than I have been in Occupy if I felt like I could just quit my job and go live in a park for two months and you know let the chips fall where they may. 
And maybe I maybe I could have done that and, and been fine. I don't have children, I'm not married. I'm probably in a more privileged position to do that than a lot of other people. My life wouldn't have ended, but it would have been a big course change. Yes. It would have been a big shift. Um, so it is difficult. You are self-limiting when you're saying that the way this movement is structured is it's people who either live together in a park 24-7 or who at minimum can spend a lot of time going to meetings and a lot of time doing stuff. Right off the bat, you're making it difficult for well, a friend of mine. Uh, she's a working single mother. And she's very involved in Occupy for someone with so many outside responsibilities. But she can't be as involved in Occupy as the 19-year-old undergraduate who can take a semester off yeah. to devote to Occupy. And by the way, they're crashing at their parents' place and they're covered by their health insurance and everything else. So yeah, that's a problem. Mm -hmm. and, um one other thing is, is there some kind of like hierarchization inside the movement in terms of like difference between the people who have been there for day one or week one and the newcomers? And I think it relates a bit to my question about protest tourism. How Occupy deals with what it has become, not even like hands-on basis what's really going on but the image that is creating which is having of course on one side really inspiring to other cities and other groups in all over the like different countries but yeah how do you deal with that uh, who comes along what reasons and uh, how do you in a way because I know it's organized by openness as a principle but if you're seeing like this protest tourism which is quite easy to recognize you cannot remain that open and so right um, I, I, I think that the, uh, the on the issue of of, uh, of who is an occupier that has been a an ongoing discussion with an Occupy right from the early days. Is an occupier the, the people the people who were involved in the New York City General Assembly before the encampment, who came up with the idea for the encampment? Are they the occupiers? Are the occupiers people who lived in the camp for the full time it existed, or even just for any amount of time? What about people who would spend a couple nights a week there, maybe on their nights off, but weren't full-time residents? What about people who just dropped in during their lunch hour? What about people who really never spent much time in Zuccotti but would join a march? Who's a re who is an occupier? What does that mean? Mm -hmm. And there's no answer to that question. Mm -hmm. It's just an ongoing discussion. I like to think that everybody who Everybody who um, shares the values of, of openness and transparency and working together to solve these problems and espouses support for the Occupy movement is an occupier. To me, an occupier can be someone who lives in the middle of Wyoming, has never been to New York City, but is writing blogs and sharing links on their Facebook page. That's an occupier. An occupier is also the anarchist in the tent. You know, it's, it's, it's all of us. You know, in, in our own way, just saying enough's enough and we're going to do what we can do to try to make things better, whatever that may be. Mm -hmm. um, as far as protest tourism, that's also, I think, a valid concern. I just came back from Chicago. I was there for NATO. It was a wonderful experience having gone out there with, um, with, with friends from New York. And I wasn't even, because I work, I wasn't able to go for the full thing. I wasn't able to go for the bus trip there and back because of my work schedule. But I, I, I flew out there. Again, the privilege of having a job as I was able to afford a plane ticket. You know, I flew out there and flew back, so I was there for a small window of time, people were there longer, and I worked kind of as a citizen journalist, uh, tweeting the marches, photographing marches for my Flickr page, and wrote a blog entry beforehand and afterwards, and actually was hit over the head, I think, by the Chicago Police Department, although it might have been by a barricade, it's tough to say, I think it was a cop with his baton. But I was there working as a citizen journalist, but even in that I was in kind of was I part of the Occupy movement or not? 
because I didn't carry a protest sign. I was there taking pictures of people with protest signs, tweeting about people with protest signs, writing blog entries, mm -hmm. but also trying to be somewhat uh, objective and have a bit of an editorial voice mm -hmm. in what I was writing. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm clearly a supporter of Occupy and really a part of the Occupy movement, mm -hmm. but I don't want to make my writing I don't want to be a polemicist because then you're not going to persuade anybody. You know, you're just people people who already believe what you believe will get all riled up, but people who don't believe what you believe, they click on to something else. So I try to talk about these radical ideas in an editorial voice and in an objective manner, giving the other side as well, so that people can make up their own mind, knowing full well the point of view I'm coming from. But it was a great experience going to Chicago, but I, and I'm talking about going up to Montreal for a similar kind of experience with, mm -hmm. with some friends of mine, and that I think would be a great experience as well, but I don't want to fall into, I don't want to become a summit hopper, mm -hmm. you know, somebody who just travels from protest to protest. I don't want to be, because we're, we're actually making our plans now, and one of the things we're talking about is, well, what if the issues with this between the students and the administration of the university get resolved before we go? Well, my view is, that'd be great. Yeah. The point is to resolve the issue. Yeah. <laughs> and if we wind up just going to Montreal and having a lovely weekend in Montreal and maybe, you know, maybe, you know, see some jazz or, you know, eat some poutine or, uh, you know, or a sandwich at, at uh, Schwartz's, that would be great. You know, and I wonder, and I haven't, dis we haven't gotten to this point in the discussion, I wonder if there are other people in the group who would be disappointed. Oh, the protest is over. <laughs> you know, well, the point of the protest yeah. is to bring about the change. Yeah. And so if both sides are able to reach a fair deal that they can both live with, mm -hmm. then that's good. Mm -hmm. You know, so we shouldn't be like, oh, geez, I hope the protest isn't over. Well, if, if the issue isn't resolved, mm -hmm. then I hope the protest continues until mm -hmm. the issue is resolved fairly. Mm -hmm. But what I'd really like to see is for the people who are organizing the protest to get the fair treatment mm -hmm. that they seek. Mm -hmm. um, and so I don't want to fall into the trap of protesting for the sake of the adrenaline rush of protesting. Exactly. For the, you know, it's fun to howl at the moon, yeah. you know, and make noise, mm -hmm. but we need to make sure, and I think by and large most people in Occupy get this. Mm -hmm. Most people understand that we're not there. Protesting can be fun, mm -hmm. but it's not a recreational activity. Mm -hmm. We can have fun while we're doing it and make it uh, whimsical and a, a fun experience for people who are aren't even involved in the protest mm -hmm. to enjoy to say, wow, that's a really clever costume, or what a, what a shrewd sign, I wouldn't have thought of that, mm -hmm. and make it fun and, 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 and not angry. Mm -hmm. um, but on the other hand, we have to realize that uh, if it becomes just a big party, mm -hmm. then we can lose focus, and I think that's a constant that's a constant struggle to remain focused. Mm -hmm. The benefit of the open source, transparent movement is that there's room for everyone. But the constant struggle is that we can easily lose focus and start tilting at windmills and not stay on task. Yes, because I think there is a um, lot of this romanticism or, or this kind of romantic attitude towards a movement because as you said at the beginning, some at some point I think this generation or our generation never had a real hands-on rebel experience or even this grassroots activism experience and it was all done in the 60s and 70s and all we hear is like glorious stories and like lost kind of golden age for everyone who defines himself or herself a bit critically it always what's going on. So I wanted to ask about this um, r romance, romantic view to, towards the movement. Are you seeing it a lot or noticing a lot? And the other question would be, are you seeing the 60s, 70s protesters joining Occupy? And what do they think about this? And is there like, is, is it their second youth that is happening now? Um, I have certainly seen people participating in Occupy who are 
of the generations who could have participated in protests in the past. Some are people who are career, you know, lifetime, lifetime activists. Some people are professional activists who have been involved in activist causes as their life's work. Others are people from all walks of life who have other jobs and other lives who have been involved in activism since they were 20 years old, you know, and now they're they're you know they're 60 years old or 70 years. Old. I took a picture of a woman in Chicago standing in front of the police lines, you know, kind of you know with a smile on her face. She had to have been 80 years old, and it was clear that this was not the first time she stood in front of a line of riot police officers. She was totally comfortable in that position and, wear, and wearing a, a t-shirt with a fist on it. She, you know, she's been there many times before. Um, so certainly have seen people that it's rekindled that activist spirit uh, and people who clearly have been involved in this before. But yes, I think also there's a romanticism among the younger generation who never experienced this that they can um, get it's involved. It's our time now. It's our time, yeah. yes. Uh, there definitely is that. Um, it's funny, as I was you know, in Chicago sleeping in a sleeping bag on, on the floor with a bunch of activists in a, in a, in a, in a house, uh, it occurred to me like, wow, so this is what it was like, huh? You know, to. No, I didn't have the full experience. Experience in that I flew in and flew out, and I have a job, and I'm I'm 20 years older than some of the folks who were there, <laughs> so I didn't really have the full experience. But I got a sense of what it's like to be 20 years old, think anything is possible, and just get on a bus with some friends to a far off place, sleep on the floor, making signs on the living room floor, and just dreaming big dreams. Because no one's, you know, even though many people have probably told them it can't be done, mm -hmm. they don't believe it. Mm -hmm. And there's power in just not believing that, mm -hmm. and just believing you can do anything. And when you have that frame of reference, you actually do get a lot done. Mm -hmm. You might not accomplish everything you set out to accomplish, mm -hmm. but by thinking you can accomplish anything, you accomplish a lot more than if you start imposing limits on yourself. Mm -hmm. And you know, just like laying there on the floor of that of that room in this house, I'm like, so this is what it was like in the '60s when people would just get on a bus and go off and, and do this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And it's been going on in other places since then. Mm -hmm. But this is the first time in my lifetime that we've really seen it on a big scale mm -hmm. in America. Mm -hmm. Can I ask you more about? Kind of personal question. Now you are balancing your own life in terms of like you have really it seems to be how can I put it like career job or you know like job in a in a high place corporate system. Oh. I mentioned that we are doing this interview in a, not the cheapest Chinatown place and so on. How are you balancing what I like to call this micro politics of everyday, the small choices of everyday, how you do, and has it influenced, uh, like, are you going less to Starbucks, for example, after you join Occupy, or you never wear a pen anyway, or, you know, how are you balancing the personal, everyday right. issues? Um, I'm certainly more aware, as, you know, we're in a sandwich shop right now where a, where a sandwich and a bag of chips and a drink just cost like ten dollars, you know, well, and came wrapped in packaging and all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. I'm much more aware of that kind of thing uh, than I used to be. Mm -hmm. uh, have I changed, I'm just looking, sure. have I changed my behavior? Yes, to a degree. Mm -hmm. um, it's convenience is very seductive and I think that that's really what people can do who maybe don't have time to to go to a protest or join an encampment or something like that is just change their own their own personal habits and I've always kind of lived within my means I've never been somebody that had to have the, the latest you know gizmo or, or you know 
I still have my TV that I've had for 10 or 15 years, and when it when it craps out, maybe I'll buy a new one. Maybe not. I hardly ever turn it on anymore. And that's I'm not one of those. You know, I'm above television. It's just I'm doing other things. Yeah. You know, it's not like I'm making a point of not watching the TV. It's just I'm doing other stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's like the number one thing people can do just in their own life is don't get seduced by having to buy things you can't afford with money you don't really have. Mm. Mm. I mean, everybody... Which was the credit crunch. Uh, right, I think that's, you know... Now, I don't... Sure, some people do bear responsibility for their own choices, but I think that we're up against hugely powerful interests mm -hmm. with powerful propaganda tools at their disposal. Mm -hmm. And what's the average person to do when they are hit over the head with messages every day, you know, thousands of times a day probably, mm -hmm. to get you to buy things that are shiny and fun and we kind of all want them in, in some ways, even though they might not really make us more fulfilled, they might make us feel more fulfilled in that moment. Mm -hmm. And so that is difficult to, to resist. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I would say that what do I what do I do to uh, one thing I've done uh, as a result of Occupy is I was paying for all these cable channels that I, I barely watch the TV much less cable. Mm -hmm. So I canceled several tiers of my cable. Mm -hmm. Now I have the bare minimum cable because I don't get reception on the broadcast channels where I live. Mm -hmm. So I have the bare minimum cable and the bare minimum internet. I hardly even watch the channels I have, so I may just scale back to internet access mm -hmm. alone. And the way I see it is I'm no longer paying for something I'm not using. So that's how I'm, you know, I just occupied Time Warner Cable by not paying them for something I'm not even using. Mm -hmm. And I think if people really do that kind of stuff, you know, if instead of spending the $10 for lunch, you know, every day of the week, mm -hmm. I do that as a treat, you know, a couple days a week. And then maybe another couple days a week, I make a sandwich at home, which you can do for a lot less money, mm -hmm. or I, you know, make a salad or something, you know, or eat just hummus and flatbread for lunch, mm -hmm. you know, or whatever. You know, it's the the point is is that much of our society is is so consumerist and geared toward uh, a bourgeois aspiration, the keeping up with the Joneses is, is the American expression. Mm -hmm. I think. If Occupy can just change that paradigm, can just get Americans to think, wait a minute, I don't have to keep up with the Joneses. What do I have against the Joneses? They can do their own thing. They want to do that? Fine. I'm going to do my thing. It's even just changed the way I view travel. Um, you know, I'm thinking more that I can have as much fun couch surfing as staying in a nice hotel. Now, I never stayed in fancy schmancy yeah, hotels. Yeah, I always just stayed in like, you know, Best Western or some mm -hmm. mid-range hotel. So it's not like I had extravagant tastes. But you know what? I can couch surf or uh, go on Airbnb and find a regular person who's looking to either charge me a nominal fee to stay in their guest bedroom or even just, you know, put me up for free for the fun of having, you know, someone from out of town for a night or two. I can do that and have more fun than giving some big company uh, money. And so it, it, it's, changed, it's changed that idea. I remember the night of the sleepful protest on Wall Street, the first night of it, it occurred to me, actually, this was the night that we all uh, camped out in front of a Bank of America branch by Union Square. It was the first night that I'd really camped out with, with, with Occupy, other than just staying awake all night. You know, the first night I laid down on the street and gone to sleep. <laughs> Maybe in my life that I'd laid down on a New York City sidewalk yeah. and gone to sleep, unless I'd fallen asleep by accident. <laughs> yeah. But... Um, but it occurred to me that people were getting out of a bar at four in the morning and walking past us, and they had just spent, you know, money mm -hmm. to create an artificial sense of community mm -hmm. that we created for no money just by laying down on the sidewalk and hanging out. Mm -hmm. That you know, people people are seeking what's real, mm -hmm. and they'll and they'll spend a lot of money for what is essentially a simulacrum of reality. Mm -hmm. When you can create a community 
for no money, just with some friends or even with people who don't know each other. Now with, with technology, you can connect with people with shared interests and, and create this community for nothing, rather than going and paying someone to create it for you. Mm. But how have you find your place inside the movements? Like, what are your current tasks or responsibilities, and uh, what kind of groups are you participating in? And how, yeah, how much time does it take from your life? And I would say what I have the groove that I've kind of gotten into with where it fits in my life is um, on my days off. I try to go to um, I try to go to at least one Occupy uh, direct action a week. If there's a protest march or a rally, well, I shouldn't even say a direct action because sometimes I'll go to a meeting as opposed to a direct action. But I try to go to one Occupy-related thing a week, either a rally in a park or a march uh, or a meeting, you know, be it in 60 Wall Street or a church basement or something like that just to connect with my friends and to either talk about ideas and solutions in a meeting or be out there on the street. And I have started to gear to, to gravitate more toward documenting the marches and rallies than carrying a sign and chanting myself. Just because I have those media skills and I have an affinity for it, um, I've kind of gotten into the groove of doing that. And I tried to do both for a while. I would you know, march for a while and chant and then take pictures, but I found that they were interfering you know with each other that I wasn't to, I didn't totally have my head in the game for either thing and that by silently marching along or near silently marching along and taking pictures I'm able to really see what's going on around me I get better pictures um, I'm less likely to be stopped by the police when I go you know into the street to get a picture because they see me as being there with a different purpose my purpose is in support of the Occupy movement but I'm not there for the exact same in the in the exact same way as someone else might be. Mm -hmm. So I'm able to move around a little bit better, mm -hmm. um, and I get better pictures, and then I can really write a better article. A lot of although I spend a lot of time just live tweeting, um, and I'm trying to go from being a mere stenographer. You know, the march is turning left on 14th Street to. Um, to folding in additional layers of descriptive detail. And I've been reading the tweet. What I've started doing is after a march, I'll read the tweets of, of people who are really good tweeters and also newspaper reporters who go to marches, sometimes live tweet things, and they're naturally good writers. So that's kind of where I got that idea from is I'm reading this and like I might tweet, you know, the march turned left on 14th Street. Someone who's a newspaper reporter and writes for a living will say, you know, it was a warm night as the march turned left on 14th Street. <laughs> yes. You know, and it's just a a little layer, and that's actually kind of a corny thing to say that. So that's not a good example, but mm -hmm. they'll get, they'll fold in just a little layer of descriptive detail mm -hmm. to try to for people who aren't there, they can be at their desk or at home or wherever, mm -hmm. and feel like they're they're connected to the movement. And if they're not at that march, maybe they'll be at the one next week, mm -hmm. but they can feel like they didn't miss it. Mm -hmm. That they, you know, it's kind of like if you don't go to the gym for a while, mm -hmm. then to try to go to the gym, you feel like, well, I haven't been to the gym in a month, so I really can't go to the gym. Well, yeah. of course you can. <laughs> you haven't been in a month, and now you'll go. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing. People sometimes feel like, I want to go to the Occupy Wall Street march, but I haven't been in six weeks, so I'm not really part of Occupy Wall Street anymore. Mm -hmm. And then that feeds into that cycle, and pretty soon, you're not, because you're not going. Mm -hmm. Whereas this way, I think by tweeting things, and, and other people are live streaming, but they're, they're, sometimes you can sit and watch a live stream and sometimes you can't. Just a tweet is all you have time for. Mm -hmm. But by helping to keep people connected, if they're on the road or whatever, they can see, oh, the march is going on and I'm part of it. They can reply to my tweet or retweet it mm -hmm. and feel engaged and feel connected and be connected mm -hmm. a, a, in a digital way. And then when they do have time to go to a march, they're not saying, I haven't done anything Occupy related in six weeks. Mm -hmm. They're saying, okay, now I can connect in person. And I've mm -hmm. had people come up to me who recognize me from my picture on Twitter mm -hmm. and be like, oh, I follow you, you know? Mm -hmm. And now we, you know, we have the basis for a conversation. Mm -hmm. 
I have only a few more questions left. Uh, one thing is that, are you feeling that your employer is somewhat getting nervous you spending the, all the free time in, in a way supporting the system that's actually against the system in a way? And how, yeah, it's a general question, how employers are viewing their employees getting more and more involved in the system critical movement? Is it the problem or issue? I'm all? fortunate in that um, because I've had a, I don't know where that's put that people. I think one coffee machine yeah, is yeah. running empty. I'm fortunate in that my in that I have a union job. Uh, Mike, not only does the law protect unionized workers to participate in activities like this, because my union endorsed Occupy. Okay. The Communication Workers of America endorsed Occupy. Okay. So therefore, a lot of laws kick in, that it becomes kind of protected union activity and that sort of thing. So there's not much they can do about it. And I think, actually, our contract specifically protects political speech. Mm -hmm. So th they couldn't really do anything. They may not like it. Honestly, I don't think they really care because I give our news department news tips on when there's going to be a march or a rally or, mm -hmm. or something they might be interested in. Mm -hmm. So I think, sure, you know, might there be some executive who might think, oh, Occupy Wall Street's a bunch of dummies and I wish our employees weren't involved in it. Sure, probably. Mm -hmm. But I think the people I interact with on a daily basis, the news people are happy that they, that they know somebody on the inside and I give them, I can say, oh, there's going to be a march on Thursday. Mm -hmm. You know, then they go, oh, geez, we didn't know about that, you know. And maybe they cover it and maybe they don't, but they now know about it and yeah. can make that decision. Um, I think sometimes balancing, uh, just as a practical matter, balancing you know time demands uh, is sometimes an issue. Um, you know, my boss might have concerns in that area, but I don't think he, I don't, I don't think he cares about the political. And he's a political conservative. Mm -hmm. He would not agree with this, but I don't think he cares at all. He's like, look, I have my own political. He writes a political conservative political blog that he's probably not supposed to write. You know, and so, although I don't think he even knows that I know that that's his blog, that's a funny thing. <laughs> <laughs> but I figured it out. <laughs> that's a good one. But, but anyway, so I don't think they care about that, but I think they do worry about time conflicts. Yeah. Okay. But we've been really talking a lot about marches, and I also followed, as a photographer, the first May march. And uh, the feeling I got was it was really like great synergy, like really like a natural high almost. You are together with people, everybody shouting and so forth and so on. But the question is, uh, and I had a feeling that you go home and uh, and in a way, then what? Right. I wanted to ask about the invisible and visible moments of Occupy because mostly when people outside see it, it's exactly those marches or rallies or some kind of public action. But mostly I understand the work goes on, so to say, invisibly in working groups and so on. How is it, how is it balanced? And, uh, and that's why I think that's where a lot of the, hey, where did Occupy go, you yeah. know, came from. Because throughout the winter, there weren't really, there were marches and there were direct actions in the sense of like disrupting foreclosure auctions and things like that. Um, but unless you're at that auction or you see the YouTube video, you're not going to know about it. Because that's not the kind of thing that mainstream media really covers. It might get covered in the Village Voice, um, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, unless, unless you're really plugged into it and, and want yes. to seek that information, for a lot of people, Occupy Wall Street went away from November or December mm -hmm. through May, mm -hmm. just because it wasn't on their radar screen. Now, Occupy was doing lots of things, having lots of meetings at 60 Wall Street, having lots of direct actions like foreclosure auction disruptions, mic checking in Grand Central, flash mobs, all kinds of stuff, but not things, the only thing that's going to get, it's going to make the 6 o'clock news is when 40,000 people are on the streets and it blocks off the traffic. Yeah. That's just the nature of it. Yeah. I think a lot of people in Occupy find that frustrating, but I think the sooner people kind of understand that the 6 o'clock news covers things that block up traffic, but it isn't going to go cover a meeting in a church basement. It just isn't. The Village Voice might be there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, New York Press might be there. Uh, uh, citizen journalists will be there, but you have to go seek, even a higher profile thing like The Voice, you have to seek it out. You know, it's not in your face like, you know, like a major TV channel is going to be. Mm -hmm. Even The New York Times, you know, the, the New York Times was slow to cover Occupy Wall Street in the beginning. 
now they, there's a regular uh, reporter who's a, a regular presence, Colin Moynihan, mm -hmm. uh, who regularly covers Occupy uh, for the Times, mm -hmm. and I think I think I think he's a very fair reporter. And mm -hmm. for me, that's that's the highest praise I can give the reporter mm -hmm. is that I think his coverage is accurate and fair. Mm -hmm. um, but even then. His articles appear in, uh, you know, in their in their in their blog posts on the website or somewhere in the metro section. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm sure he'd love to be on the front page, but he doesn't make those decisions. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, yes, it's difficult to remind people that Occupy is still out there mm -hmm. because we can't put 40,000 people on the streets every single day. Yeah, this yeah. isn't Canada. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> the future. The near future, the long-term future, your your dreams concerning exactly this movement. I would like to see. To me, I think Occupy is a part of a larger movement. I don't know that Occupy Wall Street is the whole movement. To me, it's a sub movement within a larger uh, critique, a larger global critique of capitalism. It, it fits in with the anti-austerity movements of Europe, like the Indignados in Spain. It fits in with the Montreal student strike. It fits in with the strikes in Mexico City. Mm -hmm. uh, people have compared it to the Arab Spring. I think some of the tactics are similar in terms of the encampments and things like that. Mm -hmm. I think the stakes are obviously a lot higher and that people's life yeah. is at stake yeah. in, in, in the Middle East. Uh, they're, they're very heartbeats, mm -hmm. you know, not their financial well-being um, and I think uh, I think also they're they're fighting for different kinds of issues the Greek austerity protests were slightly used similar tactics as Occupy Wall Street but the issues were somewhat different uh, many of the people involved in Occupy some people don't want there to be a government at all well in Greece the concern was hey you're rolling back our, our government run social programs so there's a bit of an ideological difference for some people but then there are other people in Occupy who want more of a social safety net so it varies I would say my dream is just that this this global critique of the status quo continues and that people take this with them if they leave Occupy and have to go to graduate school or they get married and, and have to get a job because they want to buy a house that they take Take a little bit of Zuccotti Park with them wherever they go, mm -hmm. and that it shapes their thinking, and that they don't accept, that they're not afraid to challenge authority, they're not afraid to ask questions, mm -hmm. that they don't just automatically accept the status quo as being something rigid, that they have no say over. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing that's been empowering for me is that it's been a reminder that ultimately, somebody if somebody tells you to do something, on any level, it can be it can be the traffic cop saying move over there, or it can be some larger existential question. You don't have to do it. Mm -hmm. Now there may be consequences for not doing it. Yeah. If a police officer tells you to move and you don't, you might get arrested. Mm -hmm. But and I have not been arrested. Knock wood, as so far as part of Occupy. But um, I'm willing to uh, to risk that. I know that just being present at a protest in any mm -hmm. capacity means you're risking mm -hmm. arrest. It's the unfortunate reality. It shouldn't be the case. Mm -hmm. But a lot of these arrests, the charges have been dropped or the cases, you know, have have been dismissed. And the reason is because there was no illegality in the first place. So you don't necessarily you can be at a protest not doing anything illegal. Mm -hmm. and the police trying to repress the protest may arrest you. So I'm certainly willing to take that risk. Mm -hmm. But I haven't engaged in the kind of, you know, tying myself to somebody and getting arrested, which others have. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't really matter whether you do that or, mm -hmm. or what level you participate in. Mm -hmm. Civil disobedience can simply be a matter of saying, no, you know what, I'm not available to work Saturday. Mm -hmm. You know, it can be a matter of, you know what? No, just because the commercial says I should buy Diet Pepsi, I'm going to drink water instead. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, it can it can be 
to me, what occupying this larger movement reminds people is that you can make your own choices. Now, sometimes there's a consequence for that, mm -hmm. but often the consequences are not as bad as the people in authority would want you to believe. That's the thing, is that they want you to believe that if you step even a little bit out of bounds, mm -hmm. that the consequences are these huge draconian life-ruining consequences. And I suppose sometimes they are, you have to use your judgment. But more often than not, it's a slap on the wrist or something that you can withstand, depending on your privilege and where you're coming from. Mm -hmm. You can withstand it, and it's empowering. You know, it's empowering to take control of your own destiny. Mm -hmm.